panel for the second day of the Law and Mental Health Conference on Mobile Crisis. Um, we're glad to have you here. It's the end of the day. We may have lost some people from the East Coast, but we've got some great panelists to chat with us about uh, their uh, experience and their sessions and to uh, ask some questions of each other and to take questions from the audience. If you have questions for uh, any of the panelists, uh, please just put it in the chat and I'll try to uh, get it answered. Um, let's start with let's start with introducing ourselves again and just say, you know, a little bit about how we got into this field and uh, beyond your presentation. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Shoyinka. Good evening, Jason, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all this uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for including. Philadelphia in this very important discussion. I'm a psychiatrist um, and have a background in public mental health. And I came into the crisis work as a result of my role as chief medical officer for Philadelphia's public mental health system. Back in 2017, Philadelphia began its work to expand, or I should say, re overhaul its crisis services, really beginning with the children's uh, crisis system and then in 2019, we began that work on the adult side. One of the things that really uh, spurred us to look at the crisis system was uh, feedback from our citizens in Philadelphia that they found our system uh, hard to navigate and uh, uh, slow and unresponsive. And then when we began to look at our data, we found out that uh, there was there were there were numerous opportunities to improve, and so that sort of kicked up our efforts. But as I mentioned in my presentation, the shooting death of Walter Wallace in 2020, October of 2020, was what really kicked things into high gear. Uh, I'll pause then, uh, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to share more as we get into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chief Sloan. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm April Sloan. I'm the operations section chief for the community paramedic division of the San Francisco Fire Department. I spoke earlier about the role of community paramedics and the many interagency collaborations we have here. Um, that includes the street crisis response team, the street overdose response team, uh, incident commanders within the Healthy Street Operations Center, the Tenderloin Joint Field Operations Center, and then our frequent utilizer team, EMS-6. Thanks, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jackie Thompson here. I'm over here in Portland, Oregon, and I just presented on Project Respond, which is our mobile mental health crisis team. Thanks, Jackie. Chief Stedman. Afternoon. I'm Che Stedman, Assistant Chief of Medical Affairs with the City of Madison Fire Department in Wisconsin. I oversee our CARES team, which I spoke about earlier today. Uh, happy to be here and happy to answer questions for you. What a great presentation from your mayor this morning. What a what a champion. What a great leader. Yeah, we're lucky to have her for sure. Isn't this sort of the essential in in getting one of these teams off the ground that there be some champion, some individual who pulls together not just the clinical side, but the political sides and the adversity and, and gets everybody to the round table for the first time? Yeah, certainly. We, you know, we were lucky to have um, one of our city alders uh, come forward proposing this to the fire department. So the fire department didn't have to advocate for this program. Um, it came straight from the top. So we were fortunate and we're still being well supported right now. Well, we've been joined by uh, Tiffany Patton Burnside of uh, a Department of Public Health in Chicago has just joined us. Tiffany, can you uh, introduce yourself? We're on the live panel session. Good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time of day it is. <laughs> I'm on the East Coast, so I'm going to say good afternoon. And I'm Tiffany Patton Burnside, Senior Director of Crisis Services with the Department of Public Health, Chicago Department of Public Health. Welcome, welcome. Well, I thought we would start out by not talking about the past. We'll start with the future. And and let's go around, Robin, and, and ask each other or or tell each other, uh, what's in the foreseeable future for your your team, your city, 
your uh, mobile crisis service. And we'll start with uh, uh, Chief Sloan. Thanks, Jason. Um, we actually just have, uh, it's a draft right now, but the board legislative analyst did a audit of the San Francisco street teams. So we're going over that. Um, and one of the big points is uh, sharing data and public dashboards and making sure that we are able to measure outcomes uh, and being effective. So that's definitely something on the radar there. Um, what else was in there? It just flew right out of my head. Oh, um, also today there was a, a press release from Mayor London Bree talking about the upcoming proposed bills for um, improving the LPS, which is the underpinning of 5150s and conservatorship here in California and care court here. Um, and the big change will be that for 5150s currently right now, there has to be a psychiatric diagnosis, but they're trying to amend that to include substance use and their people's ability to care for themselves. And I think that is a really, really important um, piece of legislation that is badly needed to get people the care that they need. And the other thing that that is um, on the horizon is kind of dealing with some of the, you know, as we take on this role of calls that were usually handled by law enforcement is the rub between EMS and the judicial system where we're not designed to respond to the judicial system for like a conserved patient because it's a court order. And then the additional things are, you know, the Fourth Amendment and whether we can force entry, are we held at the same standards as PD, our own use of force when we have to restrain somebody. Uh, and to be clear, we're not trained to be the first person to go hands on, but use of force has changed a lot here in California. And so that's a, a gap that we need to address. Now you use a term 5150 that Correct. some people might not be aware of. And I think every, almost everybody in this group probably has a, a special term, maybe a number. Uh, I heard Dr. Shayinka earlier use the term 370, or is that correct? Is it 370? Three, three, it's, it's 302s in Philadelphia. Yeah, voluntary commitments. Voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary. Involuntary, okay. Yeah. Tiffany, Che, Jackie, do you have a particular term of art for your involuntary commitment? We just refer to them as involuntary. Yeah, okay. chapter 51 is what we technically call it, but yes, uh, same stuff. 5150 has been used many times in various pop culture. Um, getting back to the future, uh, Dr. Shoyinka, what's, what's in your future plans? number of things. Uh, we are continuing our crisis service uh, expansion build out with, uh, we've actually procured and are in the process of having a fifth CRC getting set up. A CRC is the crisis receiving center or in Philadelphia speak, it's crisis response center. Uh, we had five strategically, strategically located around the city. We lost one at the beginning of the pandemic. We're re-procuring the fifth one. We've also have, we also have plans to procure a, an urgent care center. Um, in addition to that, uh, our system is also looking at uh, really now at this point, and actually has begun the spring uh, publicizing the uh, 98, really sort of public pushing out public service announcements. We did a survey using uh, through a social marketing firm called Little Giant to really kind of survey our, our communities in Philadelphia and learned that 80 to 90% of Philadelphians had no idea what 988 meant. <laughs> and so we've really embarked upon that task of making people aware of that. So that began this spring. I would say a final task, uh, which is reflected in my slides is really sort of uh, digging further into our metrics and using that to guide our uh, continued work on the crisis system. Uh, Jackie, what's in your future? What's in the now Project Respond, you've been around for, since I was a, a baby in this social work business. I remember coming to one of the first meetings for Project Respond in 91 or 90. Oh my goodness. Yeah, prior to a, like a, legit contract with the county we've been oh, running yeah. 30 years yeah and it's and it's changed a lot uh for good or bad i think for us we've got a lot 
that's pending, but I think it's really potentially really good. We run on a five-year contract with the county and it is coming up. So we will have initiatives that we will need to respond to, including mobile crisis, but it will also give us an opportunity within our community to say, we see gaps in our system. I wonder how we could address those gaps. And that's not going to be just with the county. There's multiple things and multiple conversations going on about these stabilization services that I think are a huge gap of this somewhere safe for for someone to go in a crisis. So I don't know exactly where we'll fit into that. I'm pretty adamant about not reinventing the wheel. We're incredibly siloed. Um, And once you get into the conversations, you find out there's some incredibly resource rich activity going on, but it feels inaccessible. And so I think the big Mm -hmm. thing that we're trying to do now is figure out how do we make sure we have referral pathways that makes sense for the gaps that we're seeing in our system and the very much increased need for mental health supports that include SUD supports as well. So I don't have like perfect plans mapped out except for a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations to try and map that out so that we can see what's the best route for us to go moving forward. We're certainly struggling here in Portland. Tiffany, what's what's in your future? Expansion, I imagine expansion um as i mentioned in um, my presentation we are looking to expand into two new districts um sometime late summer early fall and then in the winter we're looking to open our crisis stabilization unit and a sobering center um so those two things are on the horizon um we've done some hiring but very much so the conversation within chicago is expansion. I think for us, we're coming to the end of our two-year pilot. Uh, We need to determine if it's going to be extended, Um, but also it's time to look at the the, all of the data that we've collected over the two years so that we can make informed decisions about which directions that we're going to go in next. So if that is continuing a certain type of model versus what does this look like going into different shifts, versus how do we engage the communities that we're looking to expand into. So we we have quite a few conversations um, coming up in the very, very near future, like next week on what this is going to look like, especially having as many um, city partners that we have. So how does this expansion look and what will our timeframes be at our 911 call center? How do all of the different agencies staff up for this? Um, what is this gonna look like as far as training? Do we pull people directly out of the paramedic academy? Like this is brand spanking new for Chicago and this is a new, I guess, pathway within first responder work. And so we're still getting accustomed to what this looks like and how to best move forward. So I think that data that we're gonna get from Health Lab is gonna be very informative in our directions. I'll come back, um, get to Chief Stedman in a minute, but I have a question for Tiffany. Are you in this storytelling mode able to um, use any uh, voices of people who have used, provided services to anybody in the uh, uh, service community? Um, I don't, I don't think I understand your question. If you, are you able to, um, survey any clients or uh, people with lived experience of mental illness that you provided services to? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think Health Lab is uh, doing some of that. We do, we are definitely um, very cautious with, you know, managing confidentiality and and, and those things, but we have had um, clients that have given testimonials just freely. And so we've been working with, with those individuals to continue that work the clients that are able to do so. That's great to hear. Chief Stedman, you, your mayor outlined that expansion is in your future. 
Yeah, you know, and I talked about it briefly, um, you know, we're, we're still less than two years um, on the streets with our experience. And so we're still trying to build up enough uh, teams to actually handle the call volume that we have just in the city of Madison. So um, we have an expansion plan to move into the weekends uh, real shortly. And then at the end of this year to add a third team during the day, during the week, during our peak hours. But the beyond that, I, I think the the most important thing that I see coming is, is that our county um, is budgeted for a 24-7 mental health triage center. And that's something that we don't have at all. And, uh, you know, I like Jackie was saying earlier, you know, it's really the limitations can really be around where you're going to be able to take people to to get help. Um, and so, you know, we we really, um, when we started doing this, we thought, hey, you know, eventually we, we need to be a 24-7 service. But when we think right now about, you know, doing an overnight shift, um, you know, we know that there are behavioral health emergencies at 2 a.m., but we are really limited with any services that are available in the city of Madison right now overnight because we're, we're we say we're resource rich, but we're resource rich during the day, during the week. <laughs> right. So having a mental health triage center, brick and mortar, big facility that can uh, be, you know, folks can be taken to 24 hours a day is going to be really big for us. And then maybe we can think about expanding into overnight hours. Um, the other thing is going to be, um, you know, going moving outside of the city of Madison. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of the center of our county. We have a metro area around us that isn't able to utilize our services right now because we're a city of Madison service only. And so we're in talks about providing services outside of just Madison proper. And I think that'll be really important. Um, you know, there's a lot of small communities that have volunteer EMTs and volunteer firefighters that that can't be reasonably expected to be able to sustain a program like this because they don't have community paramedics. So it makes more sense for us to be able to hopefully use some county funds to be able to expand outside of our current jurisdiction. So that that's that's the big stuff we have on our plate. That's great. Now. Chief, you have a great data dashboard, and so does Tiffany. Uh, any advice for Chief Sloan about making a public facing, how to tell the story with data? Yeah, you know, um, we were fortunate to get a position in our public health department for an epidemiologist to manage all of our data collection and program evaluation. And um, and he, it was great, but he unfortunately took a job paying more money somewhere else. So once again, a workforce issue, right? Um, and so we, we haven't had a person managing our program evaluation for about six or eight months now. And so that's really hurt. So I, all I can say is, is that, um, you know, if, if you have the, the budget to hire a specialist to do this work, it's fantastic. They use Power BI was the software we use for our data dashboard, but we haven't been able to update that dashboard because we we lost that position. Um, you know, and that and and I, I didn't really talk about it much earlier, but you know, and I think other people mentioned it on on. Um, on this session is is it's really a lot of workforce issues. Our crisis workers, we've lost uh, three of them to you know better jobs. These are people with master's degrees that that leave the crisis world to go work in a hospital as a social worker, and so we've had a hard time replacing them because of the of the pay issues and the you know and the the nature of the work that we've all been talking about. Yeah, I would have to echo the sentiment of that epidemiologist. We've had one. Um, our, our dashboard would be nothing without Michael Thompson. I have to give a small shout out. And then Sarah Richards uh, Richardson in this space, uh, because between the two of them, Michael Thompson grabbing the data and Sarah helping to organize how the story is being told, making sure that we are um, honoring the work that we're doing, but also honoring the people that we're providing services to. So we're very accountable, not just to our staff, but to the city and to our stakeholders. And so this public facing dashboard really is a testament of that accountability that we have. And so much attention goes to the team on the street, but then the administration of these programs is also super important. We did just hire a data analyst. We actually, we had one prior um, and we got a new one now who is starting with us. So that will be super helpful. Um, but part of the difficulties we face is we gather data from so many different places. We have the fire department, we have DM, we have CAB, we have DPH, we have the follow-up teams. In order to get that complete picture, everybody has to get their data and, and somebody has to compile it in a timely manner and get it out there. So DEM is taking on some of that task and I expect that will we'll pick up pretty quickly. DEM is? The Department of Emergency Management. So they broadly, they oversee and coordinate 
all of the street teams in 2022, they hired a um, street response planning coordinator. So that's been immensely helpful. Uh, it helps coordinate, you know, kind of break down some of the silos and data sharing and the overlap within patient contacts and the various operations that we're doing. So really has helped us focus a lot more. Dr. Shoyunka, you had a lot of data in your slides. Do you have a, a data dashboard? We do have a data dashboard that's actually available. It's actually accessible on the DBHIDS website. Um, it is also uh, presented to the mayor, I believe, on, on a monthly basis. Mm. And we've been fortunate from the beginning of our effort to build that capability into uh, into into our work. Uh, I do agree <laughs> with with the other panelists that you know workforce issues are, are a challenge. You know, but fortunately, we've we've been able to work around work around those issues in Philadelphia. I did want to also add that um, it's not on my slide deck, but uh, the, the Philadelphia did do a pretty in, um, intentional uh, assessment of our persons who have used and accessed those services, our mobile crisis services. And I'm glad to say that again, it's not on my slide deck, but those, uh, it, but we we've had a pretty high levels of satisfaction with those services. I would say right about seventy percent of persons who have been, you know, who have been in contact with our mobile crisis teams have rated those services as highly satisfactory. That's terrific. I'll take a question from the chat. Um, and this is a question that's good for everyone. Could you tell me one thing that you would do differently if you were lifting up your program again from the foundation? What would you do differently? Not have COVID. <laughs> Um, I think for Chicago, a big thing for us is infrastructure. Um, our infrastructure was not designed for this new line of business, if you will. And so I think actually taking a hard line analysis of what infrastructure we do have so that we could have maybe put some different things in place prior to um, having the teams hit the ground. I think a lot of emphasis from my from my standpoint, from when I started, went in making sure the teams were um, able to do the work and then on the back end trying to determine, okay, how does this look within our 911 call system, which isn't designed for this. So what training now needs to go into this agency to get gear them up and prepare them for this. And it kind of, did, it should have happened. I would, if it were me, um, redoing it it could have all happened at the same time or we would have we should have figured out a way to make it happen at the same time instead of um, staggering how the training went because we had teams out and the call center not being fully um, not fully understanding the nature of the work like they understood the task but they didn't understand the nature of the work and so we did a lot of work with sending clinicians having clinicians there making sure we build the relationships and then training and retraining with every step of the way, giving success stories and helping the other staff that are connected to the program have a better understanding of what it is the goal of the program is. I think that was making sure that across all of the agencies, the messaging was the same or being intentional. Thanks, Tiffany. So wise. Chief Sloan, any ideas? What would you do? How, what would you do differently? Um, similar to what Tiffany said, it would be kind of support staff. The fire department is not, you know, we're we're first responders. We're emergency. We don't typically, you know, do a lot of the the data analyzing and the report outs and all of these things that, you know, DPH, DM, HHS, They have people specifically for those roles that have that experience in those roles. And for us, it's been a big learning curve on some of these. Um, so yeah, uh, more support within our division to allow us to really, you know, in the, in the beginning it was really super hectic um, trying to like run operations and do training and um, the schedule every day. And it was a lot. So some of it has, um, as we've sort of integrated in with the department, like they've taken over more of the duties that normally would go on, but it's been challenging because uh, as Tiffany had said, they don't understand the work and you know like our our 
here they usually do staffing like one day in advance. Um, but for me, doing it one day in advance, if I find out I'm down three units, that's a big problem. <laughs> you know, whereas on the suppression side, if they're down, you know, they can brown out, they can run short. I can't, I can't do that. So um, support staffing specific to us would be helpful. And do you have a ability to um, hold those people in employment against their will? We can mandate people, but with the first schedule we came out with, so our, traditionally um, we run what we call a three, four flop, you know, front half, back half with a Wednesday or a Saturday flop. That means you can only mando people on Sunday and yeah. Thursday, you know, or when, you know, so it doesn't give us enough coverage. Uh, so we just had a bid because it's going to go into effect in August, but we will have much more availability of mandation. And sit these th four of you are cities, Jackie, you have probably a little more flexibility in hiring and recruitment, but boy, the timeline to get somebody on board is just injurious. Mm. Anyone else have uh, uh, thoughts about what you would do differently? Um, I think I would add, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tiffany. Oh, yeah, I would add back to the infrastructure. Um, all of our staff are represented by different unions. So having the unions at the table and having those conversations early on so we could resolve things like shifts and lunches um, <laughs> is, is trivial as that may sound when it actually plays out in on the van with the different disciplines of staff trying to figure out and honor their own unions and their own um, policies and procedures. It's definitely, uh, in the beginning, it definitely caused some, some tension, but to be able to have those things laid out so everyone knows how to move forward, I think would have been helpful. Very good, very good, Jackie. Mine started kind of trivial and I was getting into the weeds in my head. The trivial piece is just doubling the staff. Like we really didn't know when we did this five years ago, how many staff we would need and nor would I ever have wanted to prepare for COVID and what I think we will still see as after effects for mental health for that. But um, when I look at all this information, like 26 FTE for a 24 seven model, in the entire county is so small. And I just I just don't, don't think I ever realized that until we started figuring out how many calls we were getting and what that looked like. And then the overall big picture is, I think we need to be much more embedded into all crisis services. We, our county has made the representatives to um, provide mental health services. And our city provides basically med medical services emergency and we need to figure out how to combine those because the emergencies we're going on are, are need to be a collaborative effort and um just resources in our community seem pretty siloed and maybe there was good reasons for that in the beginning but the calls we're seeing always have a component that seems medical that needs to be addressed immediately and then absolutely a mental health component that also needs to be addressed And how, what's the drive time from your, on average? Do you, do you have a number? It really depends. We're considered centrally located, um, but we go out to like Troutdale. And if we've oh. got a team out there, anyway, it's, it's on average, it's about 20 minutes. Um, our contract requires us as much as we can um, to be dispatched within 30. So arrive on scene within 30. Um, and I can say it depends on staffing. <laughs> when we have calls pending every day um, and we don't even incorporate those, right? Like it's from the time you get the call and then dispatch is your 30 minutes. So that's something to note that I always want to, I don't know, give the community the benefit there. Like you are feeling like you're waiting too long because you are. We're meeting our requirements because they're from dispatch, but you guys are waiting too long and we need we need more manpower for sure. Dr. Shoyinko, what's uh if you were to do it over again? 
I feel like we've been very fortunate in Philadelphia. Um, we had the benefit of the templates from the children's uh, expansion. We had the benefit of starting early in 2019, and uh, we were able to study some of the mature systems in the country and pull all that together in a strategic plan. We had the support of the city, uh, city council, the mayor's office funded uh, these efforts um, uh, extensively. Um, we, we've had real good partnership from our uh, other stakeholders in the system. We had a learning collaborative that included um, a broad range of uh, partners and that's been you know pretty important getting everybody on the same page who had partnership from our law enforcement and fire department so can't really complain about anything really we had great leadership uh, from our commissioner who's been all all in on this uh the things that we're challenged with that we have been challenged with i would say are just some of those things that you really can't predict. You know, I mentioned we lost the CRC right at the beginning of COVID, which placed incredible stress on our system, particularly our, our other CRCs. We've, like everybody else has talked about, we've been challenged by staffing during and, and since COVID. And, uh, you know, we really haven't gotten back to pre-COVID levels of staffing. Or We have uh, been working on pipeline programs to change that but you know those things take time to mature and to start to deliver um and then of course uh there i i would say one of the other challenges again it's it's systemic and you really this is nobody's fault but the uh lack of awareness not just of global crisis services 988 but broadly the uh range of mental health services in our system is is a problem because then people end up trying to access services in other ways or falling off into other systems where they're not well served. So um, I would say we've been exceptionally fortunate in Philadelphia with our efforts and you know, with a lot of kudos to city, our leaders uh, at the department and, and our partners in the system. Thanks. Chief Stedman, do it over. Oh, did you yeah, you, you know, we we spent so much time trying to learn from other people's mistakes and uh, just steal as much information as possible from all these other successful programs that I asked that question a lot to folks, you know, like, you know, in the beginning, what would you have done different? Um, but I can still say, even after trying to figure out um, all of the hurdles that everybody else went through, um, we certainly found our own. Uh, for me personally, I, I didn't think things were going to take as long to get to, to happen. In other words, I wasn't aware of, of um, what it was going to take to get all the contracts together, how many different partners really truly needed to be in the room. We started with a smaller group of people than we ended up with that, that were the stakeholders that needed to really give us the advice and, you know, talk to us about best practice in our community. Um, so, you know, uh, but other than that, I would say the big thing is probably that we would have looked into peer support sooner. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of good th things about the utilization of peer support. We we do have uh, um, uh, an agency called Safe Communities in Madison that that, that has a lot of peer support, um, a, a lot of folks with a lot of different lived experiences, and we're trying to tap into them when when needed. But I can say that you know to have peer support actively on our team um, is is one thing that that um, if we could have maybe budgeted for and been more thoughtful about, um, that's probably the one thing we could have spent more time on. Thanks, everyone. Chief Sloan, you had a, a comment in our chat about the civilian onboarding of new peers. You want to mention what you're doing? Um, you know, as Tiffany mentioned, like the friction between, you know, they these are civilian contractors, usually. Um, some of them have unions, some of them have lunch breaks. But what we also ran into is, you know, we sometimes very often on view calls that to us are like run of the mill. To them, it's really not it's very new, it's, it's dramatic, it's upsetting. Um, so, and then we've had a few things where, you know, it was like an MCI response and they requested our vans for, you know, part of our disaster response plan now is to fold our vans in as a form of patient transport, you know, like they're right there, they're readily available, anyone can drive them. You can get like 10 greens in there. Um, uh, what was the other big one that kept coming up? And then some, you know, some little training about like, you're in the public eye, you can't lean back in the seat and sleep. You need to, um, you know, always know that like if you are sitting on the same corner for an extended period of time, people are going to notice it. 
Um, and then the safety officer role, you know, like really clarifying that like the medic is the hard stop. And I mean this from like a, a very much an ICS perspective where the safety officer is off to the side and the medic is the one who calls the hard stop. It doesn't mean you have to end the call, but you do all have to pull back, you know, talk together and figure out if you can safely keep doing that. Very interesting. Um, question from the chat. And we heard yesterday about people with neurodivergency and addressing their needs really takes a whole different toolkit. And several times people have mentioned over the last uh, day or so about mobile crisis for children, for youth, it needs to be really substantially different than um, you know, the bell curve average training. Is Are there special communities that you're finding that really need special attention? Anybody like to speak to that? Is anyone doing mobile, anyone uh, going out and seeing kids? We are. We are as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I have, um, I mean, I'll just say we've seen, we've always been able to see kids. We can see any age, um, but we've seen a drastic increase in youth and youth were, we're going with our state um, definition, which is anybody under the age of 20. But I mean, I'm talking about like we saw a six-year-old the other day and it's, it's, it's so many referrals now that we, we've have, um, a specialty sub team we've had for a long time and it's meant to be a bridge service. So again, if our mobile crisis team goes out, sees that a family and a youth need ongoing services that they're not quite connected to yet, we have a team that we can refer to for that. Again, it's super small at full capacity, it's a master's level and an undergraduate level that provides support to families that are referred from the crisis team. And now we're seeing such a drastic increase. We're trying to make sure that we have more supports for that. And lovely, the state, our state has very much witnessed that and now has mandates on mobile crisis and designated funding for required stabilization services for anybody under the age of 20 if they want it our system needs to get up to that level to provide that care. We don't, we wonderfully have the supports and then the infrastructure isn't there. So we are we are seeing the need, we're addressing it as much as we can with specialties within our crisis team that have a background and education in working with specifically youth um, and young adults, but also we're trying to make sure that we understand those referral systems that are very different and um, also making sure that our stabilization services, which are super specific by our state now, are more robust in our community so that we can meet that requirement that's absolutely needed of making sure anybody that wants it under the age of 20 can have those uh, unique services provided to them after a crisis. Tiffany? Yeah, we went live with uh, adolescents 12. So our, our age went down from 18 to 12 um, earlier this year. But we're fortunate in Illinois that we have um, what's called SAS, which is uh, a state funded program for children and adolescents. And any child or adolescent who is in a mental health crisis is able to get a crisis team to um the school, to the hospital that they may be at. At one point pre-COVID, I feel like they were going to homes. So we already had, the state of Illinois already had that service in place. And, and for that particular program, they also offer, I feel like 60 days or 90 days follow-up for the youth that was in crisis. And so because we've that was already established, it's been established for a very long time. <laughs> and so because of that, we just worked with the um, with the state and those providers. So we're pretty much, I guess, a bridge. Our program, the care program is a bridge from the time the crisis happens until that SAS worker may get to the child. So we'll do that initial intervention and then hand off. Oh, that's great. That's so fortunate to have those resources. Dr. Shoyinka, you are seeing kids. Yes, we are. Um, we have a whole um, system of care, crisis uh, crisis system that serves kids. So we've got 
um, mobile teams, children's mobile teams. We have two types of children's mobile teams, short, what we call CMCT, which are the, they engage the individual and their families over a period of about 72 hours. It's regionalized. And then we have the longer term engagement teams, which engage over about a six week period and can, it's really based on a recognition that crises don't turn themselves off after a defined period of time. And sometimes there are factors in the environment, social determinants, family dynamics and such that can prolong the crisis. And so those longer term teams are able to stay with the family and the individual until those, hopefully those crises are resolved or they can be safely transferred to uh, to other, uh, syst other systems or other um, resources. I should mention very quickly, uh, uh, just referring back to your, the earlier discussion about what challenges we experience, I, I would say, uh, so that it doesn't sound like, oh, we've got everything figured out and Philadelphia is perfect. <laughs> it certainly isn't. Uh, the one thing that I think we all underestimated in the beginning was there's the work of setting up the structures, right? Setting up the team, staffing them, whatnot. And then there's what the bigger task, which I think uh, is the culture change to where those teams themselves are engaging, you know, from that philosophy that really resolves care and resolves those crises. And, you know, where everybody's playing together nicely in the sandbox, so to speak. And that takes a long time. We've certainly seen um, the need to continue to work on those on those pieces. So I just wanted to hark back to that real quick. Is it, having everyone at the table at the very beginning seems to be an essential component here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, a another question from the chat, which is um, the engagement of outside community members in helping to shape your program, whether it be uh, legal advocates or mental health advocates or um, folks representing underrepresented communities, cultural communities, perhaps the racial justice community. Has anybody had experience in the shaping of their programs by outside uh, community members? Um, absolutely, 100%. I'll just jump in with that one. Um, so again, we were fortunate to have some of those resources already existing in existence in Philadelphia. So we had a family treatment advocate uh, advocates committee that had pre-existed. But um, when we first started putting our plans together, we went to them and said, hey, look, we're thinking about doing this within our crisis system. Would you work with us to make sure that this uh, these plans or these ideas that we have are grounded in reality? And address the lived experience of our community members. And they were only too happy to jump in with us and really give us, and they gave us some very candid feedback. You know, I'll tell you just a couple of uh, places where this feedback was crucial. The first was um, where systems often, or our system, I should say, uh, was experienced as heavy handed, where, you know, families often um, experienced 302s, we talked about 302s earlier, as being applied too quickly. Another area where that where we got very good feedback was the, the our, our service users, peers, their families really felt like we they were not able to get information, certainly not timely in a way that would help them to help their, their loved ones. So, you know, loved one is discharged from the from the hospital, nobody called. Nobody told the family what was going on. They just show up on the doorstep. We don't know what to do. There's no aftercare plan that we were involved in. Uh, so those are that's that level of involvement we found to be very useful, and they have stayed engaged uh, in 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 those efforts all the way through. Learn with the learning collaborative, and and so on. As other have others had uh, shaping experience by outside community members. Well, let me then skip on and, and ask a hard question. What are we going to do about fentanyl? 
we just have a temperature check and, and each of you tell us, you know, how fentanyl is affecting your teams. Tiffany? Um, I would say <laughs> poorly. <laughs> um, we definitely had seen like a spike in overdoses, but uh, over the last couple of weeks and in, in our teams have been um, actively handing out fentanyl test strips as well as Narcan. But what we aren't able to determine is if it's fentanyl or xylazine. So we have some other stuff going on in Chicago. I don't know how big xylazine is in other jurisdictions, but it is something of note here. And we're, uh, the, our Chicago Department of Public Health is working to get test strips so that we can start uh, moving around, promoting the education of this next thing. So that's kind of where we are, but we definitely like our, we have an opioid response team and they have been working specifically in um, one of our areas is considered like a corridor, if you will, where it has like some of the highest overdose overdoses in the city. And so they have been working with individuals that they've identified through um, our fire department data and um, working to find those individuals as well as um, anybody that may know or have encounters with the individuals in question, just so that we can continue to educate and um, be very proactive with harm reduction kits. And that's in a specific geographical section, just a, um, a big neighborhood, but just a specific area that has that OPATE team? Yes. And um, they're looking at data. I don't, I can't speak to if, when that will be, that, that particular team will get an expansion because it's so new. It just went live um, in the spring this year. And so it's still very new and we're still um, collecting data. Like we just got an epidemiologist that's going to kind of work to break this, this information down, hopefully um, taking from our lessons from when we went live with the mental health teams so that we can get uh, to the information that we need sooner than we did with the other teams. So taking our lessons learned as we expand to kind of uh, shorten our learning curves, if you will. No. Oh. Chief Stedman, has, got, has fentanyl gotten to Madison? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, we've, uh, as a fire department, uh, of course, we've been dealing with it for a little while now. Um, but specific to our crisis response team to CARES, um, we, we've we just recently gotten, um, similar to what Tiffany was talking about, working with public health for what we call a leave behind program. So it's, a, you know, it's essentially, it's a packet that has uh, fentanyl test strips, Narcan, and uh, resources, pamphlets, and, and things of that nature um, to guide people and family members um, to, you know, get more information. Um, so that that's really the only kind of newer thing that we're doing around it. But, um, it, you know, opioids, synthetic opioids have always have been an issue in Madison for a long time. Um, so but yes, that is a newer program that leave behind program. Dr. Shoyinka, we've all read about Kensington. What's going on in yeah. Philadelphia? Yeah, so I'll echo what uh, Tiffany said about xylazine. Um, <clears throat> we've seen during COVID, we've basically seen uh, the city's drug supply go from heroin and uh, the synthetic uh, uh, pills to fentanyl. And now fentanyl is baked into everything, including stimulants. So we, we saw that happen during COVID. And so we saw this steep rise in uh, deaths from stimulant use, some of which were due to stimulants, but some of which were due to um, opioid naive people uh, encountering fentanyl in their drug supply. So we saw that, and we also saw a change in the demographics of who was get who was dying from those overdoses. Uh, xylazine, as I mentioned, has also made its way it's, it pretty well in everything now. So that's unfortunate. The city has had a number of uh, strategies to respond to this. So we do have a, an opioid response unit at the city level that um, comprises several city departments. And I would say one of the more innovative things that Philadelphia has done to respond to the situation in Kensington specifically has been to set up an alternate response unit. So these are um, teams that are, that, that are made up of 
basically a, a, a fire EMS um, uh, personnel and behavioral health trained personnel who can respond to a person who's overdosed basically uh, in real time so they can get to the, to the spot, administer Narcan as needed. And what is really um, cool, I should say, about those teams is they're often able to fast track people into treatment so they can get people. Philadelphia is fortunate to have a lot of treatment resources and they can basically uh, get a person off the street and into treatment in as little as two hours, which is really uh, quite remarkable. But if you think about what we're dealing with, it's really necessary as well. And uh, same thing about, you know, Nar uh, Narcan. And I mean, that's been in in Pennsylvania, there's a standing order for, you know, Narcan can be purchased over the counter, um, really. So, um, yeah, that that's what's been done at the city level, among other things. Jackie, if you're encountering a fentanyl addict who looks at you in the eye and says, I'd like to get the drug treatment today, what do you tell them? Let's try. Can we call in any favor, any person we know, any worker that's working there and say, what can we do? And it's, I, it would be so rare day of. Um, What's the average wait for an intake appointment? A week. You can, you know, Hopefully the motivation is still there at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Can you can we get you a cab? Can we get this cab over here at 6 a.m.? Can you be ready to go at 7 a.m. so that you can get in line and wait and hopefully get in and take that day? But it depends what you've taken and if you need to detox and what center allows for detox or not. It's complicated and that just blows me away that you can get somebody in within hours. And also like incredibly motivating to me, like what, what if we had that, that, that is what we need. When you talk about this question of fentanyl, it's the bigger question of substance use and mental health and combining those services instead of making them separate, right? They aren't separate. It's the chicken or the egg. You can choose one, but you have to coordinate these services. And that includes um, mobile crisis. We, you know, something I should have thought of when you're talking about like the future, the future, we need to incorporate specific substance use clinicians, peers, all of the above into our crisis response as well, so that we can make sure education wise, we are very, very comfortable talking about substance use, know what we're talking about, know how we should ask about it. We are extremely harm reduction. Um, and we carry Narcan with us. And now we wonderfully have enough that we can just distribute it. But even that's changing rapidly. Like one dose of Narcan is not gonna do it. Like even our procedures <laughs> of, of how this works, like you have to at least give two. So every time like we're putting a procedure together, which is such a frustrating process, but you have to do it. So even the procedure for distributing Narcan based on the needs is already behind. Like, oh, here you go. Here's your one dose of Narcan. Like, oh, that's not gonna work. Here's four <laughs> and here's test strips and here's stuff to do that. Um, but we need to go back one step and say, we need to be much more comfortable asking the questions about use. And of course, making sure we have resources to refer people to if they want them, but also just knowing that we need to just ask so that we can say needles aren't necessarily a thing anymore, but do you know where to get clean needles? And do you know where to get fentanyl strips? And if you don't want the Narcan right now, do you know where to get it for a super reduced cost or free? And do you know where you can get it where we can even say, you can walk in here and get zero judgment because that's going to be a thing too. People are going to not go if they think they're going to get judged or arrested is always a worry. Um, but I'll stop there. I digress. <laughs> Yeah, we're not only defeated by the illnesses here, but we're defeated by our own lack of preparation to manage these illnesses. And it's these experiences of talking to each other in different cities and different communities that dealt with these problems in different ways to figure this out. That we're either you know, doing really well. It sounds like Philadelphia, Dr. Shoyenka, you've been a great leader here and help folks get organized and realize the complexity of the problem and the extent. 
or Che and, and April, where you've lifted up these programs just in a short matter of time. Tiffany, just fabulous work in the midst of these gigantic bureaucracies. It's really incredible. I'd like to thank you all for presenting sessions at this conference and for joining me in this panel. It's been really interesting. I hope we get to talk again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Thank you.